Hello, my name is Orion Colfer. I'm an emergency physician. Excited to be with you today to share a bit of an unusual perspective on risk management. So we're calling this Manage Yourself, Manage Your Risk, but I prefer the subtitle. You have the power to reduce your risk of being sued by being your best self. And I like that because it's positive, it's hopeful, optimistic, and I think empowering. And let's be honest, we need that, particularly in the work that we do and with our risk management. Because so many of the variables that contribute to the risk that we manage and deal with every day, every shift, feels like it, they're completely out of our control and that we're powerless. We're just kind of tiptoeing around in, in the emergency department trying to avoid stepping on that landmine. And while much of what contributes to our risk is very much out of our control, or only marginally, maybe on our best days, in our control, there actually are opportunities to manage our risk and reduce our risk by managing to become our best self and really becoming skilled, effective communicators and connectors. And that's what we're going to focus on here. So we've learned from Dusty Otwell and John Bedoya that the worst risk or the, the greatest contributor to our risk is related to bad outcomes. But I hypothesize that those bad outcomes in our risk is exponentially worsened when an unhappy patient suffers a bad outcome. And that's really the genesis of our worst risk. So let's explore that and consider that there's some research out there to, that, that will help to um, make these points. So here's a, an article published in the American Journal of Medicine looking at the relationship of patient satisfaction, complaints, and lawsuits. In this case, examining inpatient physician Prescani surveys and their relationship to complaints and medical malpractice risk. Not surprising, but interesting. Physicians with scores in the bottom third, two and a half times as many complaints, two times as many risk management episodes, and 110% more likely to have a malpractice suit. So that's not good. It supports our hypothesis, but I can already guess what you're thinking. Uh, that's bad news for the hospitalists, but call me when you have something from the emergency department. Well, here comes that call. So a similar study examining the relationship between patient satisfaction, complaints, and lawsuits, this time in the emergency department for EM docs, published in the Journal of Emergency Medicine, an exhaustive review of over 146,000 press Ganey surveys from over 34 emergency departments over four years. Interestingly, in this analysis, they did not see a correlation between satisfaction scores and risk. However, significant correlation with risk and complaints. In fact, so much so that docs with more than one complaint per quarter had a four times increased risk of medical malpractice episodes. So that's not good news. Let's flip the script here for a moment and consider not Consider this not from our perspective, but from the perspective of patients. And an interesting question to ask is, how do patients judge quality? Asked and published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. And the answers that we got, that they got, were actually not probably terribly surprising, but really interesting. Patients' perception of the quality of their care providers strongly associated with communication skills. So almost independent of diagnostic skills, uh, and even outcome, uh, providers that were judged to listen, explain, show respect, and spend time were judged by patients to be high-quality providers. So what do we know? Bad outcomes equal risk. Unhappy patients equal risk. Bad outcomes plus unhappy patient is the worst kind of risk. Capital, risk with capital letters and an exclamation point. Good communication, at least from the patient's perspective, is equivalent to quality, and complaints are really, really, really bad, particularly as they relate to medical malpractice. So, well, what can we do about it? The first skill to be, uh, to, to practice and become uh, adept at using the power of shared decision making. And you've already heard about this from John Bedoya. These are care decisions that are made together in conjunction with the patient, their family members, and the clinician. 
This requires information symmetry. Patients have to understand the risk that they're taking and the decision that they're making. But it, it turns out everything we do or don't do, every test we do or don't do, every treatment that we do or don't use, every disposition that we make has risks wrapped into it. So there's risk in sending somebody home, but there's also risk in putting them in the hospital. And it turns out that patients are actually comfortable taking risk when they understand the risk that they're taking. And that's what shared decision making allows us to do. Communicate with them such that they can make a, 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 their own judgment about the risk that they're willing to take. Requires agreement. Provider and the patient and family have to be on the same plan. So somebody signing out against medical advice is, advice is not shared decision making. But when you can execute on this, it's incredibly empowering. It allows patients to have control and it demonstrates trust. And that's ultimately the, the trusting relationship is what we want to establish with the patient. Shared decision making is a risk management antidote for bad outcomes resulting from small but predictable risk. So get good at doing this, have these conversations, learn how to communicate with patients around the risk and the decisions that they're gonna make and then allow them to make those, discuss it and document it, which is all fine and good, except that only works when you have reasonable, rational people that you're dealing with. And we know that that, that certainly is not everybody that we have to encounter in the emergency department. So what about the angry, the unhappy, the upset, the frustrated, the acting out? What's the plan there? So we'll use the construct of angry patient to sort of encapsulate all of those different issues. And one of the things that we normally and very naturally will do when we encounter somebody that's coming at us that way is to sort of sort them. And often we'll sort based on how, do we, how justified do we believe their upset is. So somebody who's been waiting for six hours, okay, maybe that's a reason, maybe that's a reason to be upset. 30 minutes, maybe not so much. Somebody says, ah, oh, I was, the triage nurse was really rude to me. You say, well, who's in triage today? Oh yeah, well maybe they are justified. But I say, throw that construct out. Justified, not justified, who cares? It doesn't do us any good and it doesn't move us any further along. Try approaching it this way, sorting these people that are coming at you in this fashion into reasonable and unreasonable, or better yet, potentially reasonable and unreasonable. And here's the strategy. When I'm encountered, when I, when I have to encounter somebody that's coming at me like this, I'm gonna lead with a, with a dose of empathy. Empathy being the communication skill of actively communicating with a patient that I understand where they're coming from and how they're feeling and why they might be feeling that way. It's an active expression of trying to get on the same page with them. I am here, I'm listening, I understand where you're coming from. And remarkable things happen when you can effectively empathize with people in general, but certainly with upset patients. And really often, when you effectively empathize, you take the wind out of the sail of that upset and you can actually get people that appear on, at first bl uh, blush to be completely unreasonable to actually move into a place of being quite reasonable. And if at first you don't succeed with empathy, try, try again. And I advocate three doses of empathy up front. And I use the word doses very specifically here because I think about empathy like medicine. In fact, if we had a therapeutic intervention that could accomplish for us what empathy can accomplish, particularly for the upset patient, You'd be giving it out all over the emergency department. So treat with three doses of empathy and see what kind of results you get. I even think about it almost like a, like a treatment algorithm. Um, when I see, when I'm encountering the patient that's unreasonable or upset or angry or whatever, I'm gonna lead with a dose of empathy. The easiest way to do that up front is the blameless apology. I'm sorry you had to wait. Or I'm sorry that that happened to you today. I'm sorry you were treated that way. No one should be treated badly. That was rude and disrespectful. I'm sorry about that. If that recovers them into reasonability, then I can go ahead and do my acute care thing. We're gonna connect and I've got a patient that I can take care of, but I'm also managing my risk. If the first dose of empathy is enough, then I'm gonna try two more times. And at the end of three sincere attempts to empathize, if I still have an unreasonable patient, well, then I'm gonna sort them to unreasonable and have a little bit of a different strategy for how to manage that. I'm gonna do what I'm professionally and legally obligated to do, a medical screening exam, 
but I'm going to be a pro, and I'm not going to get emotionally hijacked or real upset or allow this to disrupt the whole environment. We'll get to the really upset patient in a moment. But I want to offer a special consideration here. And that's the patient who isn't necessarily outwardly acting really upset, but you have a pretty good sneaking suspicion that they're not really quite happy either. And there's a moment here where, and it's usually at the point of disposition, you go in there and you kind of tell the patient or the family the plan, and you look for agreement, and you don't necessarily get agreement, but you don't necessarily get like outrage and total pushback. And you have a moment where you can make a decision about, do I want to take this a level deeper and really ask them what's going on, and I get a sense that you're not satisfied or happy with the plan, or do I just want to turn around and walk out the door and get away? And when I'm not being my best self, I want to, I'm going to walk out the door and move on to the next thing, because Lord knows there's a hundred things out there for me to do. But when I'm in my best self mode, I'm going to lean into this and investigate and ask. I get the sense that the plan, as I've laid it out, isn't, you're not satisfied with that. What's going on? What else do we need to know? What else is on your mind? And that's not only a brave thing to do, but it's a really smart thing to do. And it's a really important risk management skill to have. And here's why. I'm not, I don't have data to back this up, but I suggest that the patients who are striking you this way or their family members are disproportionately friends and neighbors of your CEO and the hospital board of directors, and they're probably a country club members with both of them. These are, the, these are the patients who leave that you think you got to a place of closure with, and then that complaint comes in a couple of days later or a week le later, and it's a really big deal. And if they don't have a bad outcome, then it's just a complaint, and you got to deal with that, and that's never a good thing to have. But it's, if that situation leads to a bad outcome, and you couple that with the sense of I wasn't listened to, I wasn't heard, they weren't trying to get where I was coming from, that's where the risk gets really bad for us. So be brave, lean into it, and give it a try. Back to the truly unreasonable patient. So you've gone through your process, you've sorted with empathy, you've treated with your three doses, and they're still not ready to meet you at any place that looks like they're reasonable. You need to have a special set of skills and a strategy and habits to manage this. Specifically, especially if they're acting out, be prepared to de-escalate. And the de-escalation skills are almost paradoxical because you, you need to be able to connect with them at the same and, and really be present and mindful and listen, but also not be physically imposing. You kind of have to manage your body language and your uh, nonverbal communication while at the same time being really, really respectful, which means making eye contact and giving them a chance to say their piece, even though you might be ready to fight back right away or it seems like it's just not going to be helpful to do that. Give them a moment. Focus, easier said than done, but focus on issues, not personalities. This person who's completely acting outrageous in front of you isn't some off-the-hook jerk. It's somebody that's dealing with some kind of chronic, terrible chronic medical issue, and they need a test or a treatment that, although you're not able to get it for them in the emergency department that day, is something they may very well actually need. Or they're a family member that's hit the end of their rope, and they don't know how to take care of their... Uh, disabled relative or their geriatric parent. Um, so it's not the personality, it's not even how they're acting or behaving, it's the issue that's at stake. Do some investigation, ask questions, try to get a full perspective on really every aspect of this. What were they like coming in? Did people see them when they walked in? Were they you know, completely off the hook right from the get-go or did this develop over time? Who else interacted with them along the way? Look through your medical record. If they've been there before, is this a pattern of behavior that we've seen from them? Are there other staff members that are familiar with them? You don't want to fall into the, uh, you don't want to fall into the trap of assuming they're crazy because at some point in the past they may have acted crazy or um, you know, the staff just has a bad memory of some previous visit. But you really don't want to make the mistake of, of, of mistaking um, you know, acute delirium or metabolic encephalopathy for somebody who's just being... Uh, difficult and unpleasant. Do your best to problem solve. Offer solutions. Ask the patient if they have potential solutions. 
realizing that there are limitations and boundaries to what you can and can't do. But a patient who's not willing to even engage in like some kind of proactive problem solving endeavor is somebody that's probably going to sort to that unre unreasonable place and you're probably going to need to go to get to a point of closure there that you know may not necessarily solve their problem especially if they can't help you with what they actually need or want interestingly the truly ups out, upset and acting out patients um, generally tend to pose less risk to us in terms of medical malpractice because totally unreasonable people make for relatively poor plaintiffs. Nonetheless, you want to manage your risk here through your documentation. So specifically and in a relatively straightforward manner, describe what happened, what the behavior was, what your plan was, how things went down. You want to be able to document inappropriate behavior and comments that you witnessed or that the staff witnessed, but you want to do it in a, you know, in a relatively emotionally removed way. You don't need to add editorial comment to that. And you also want to make sure that the rest of the staff that interacted with the patient is documenting along the same lines so that all of your records are kind of, um, uh, there's congruity in, the, in, in what's going to be read the next day or down the road if it ever comes up again. Are you kidding me? Do you know how many people? I've got seven rooms okay. back there. I made an appointment at 6.30 because I knew that being out of my bed an hour and 45 minutes. And we've already been working on you. you. We've done a in. urine test on you. I've Nobody's, seen you. You came in and said, I'm going to check your pee. I Does that take three room. seconds, you think? I don't know how long Do you want to be seen or not? I want to go home and get in my bed. I'm then miserable. fine. Get the hell out. Get your money and get the hell out. I did. But that See you later. Is just rude. Really? Really? If you go to care spot, you're waiting for three hours. Go to the ER and wait for nine hours. Okay, you can get out of her face. Out of my office. I will complain with a better business. Mom, I got it on video, so it doesn't matter. Go. So, your heart just sank, I'm sure. Um, and if you haven't had the experience of knowingly being recorded. Uh, you almost certainly have been recorded without your uh, knowing about it. Uh, so this is almost a ubiquitous behavior now. Uh, people running around recording and streaming and, and uh, oftentimes, more often than not, without the knowledge of the people that are being recorded. And it's happening more and more frequently uh, in our setting. So first thing to be aware of, like, what are the rules? What, what's actually going on here? And the rule, the law, the, the law really depends on the state that you're in. So there are single party states and two party or all party states. And essentially, if you're in a single party or a one party notification state, which on the map here in the lighter shade of uh, gray, all that's required, uh, the, the legal obligation for recording a audio or video recording is just that one person in the recording exchange consent to the recording. So if you're in one of those light gray states, patients can run around and record you and really anything else they want, they being consenting to the recording, and there's really no legal repercussions for them. There's no legal action that can be taken. If you're in a two-party notification state, at least according to the state law, they would need to get consent from the other people being recorded. But I'm not sure how much that protects us when they've recorded it and it's blasted out to social media or if it's live streamed. Um, so I think to a certain extent, it really doesn't matter what the law is, at least as far as how we're going to prepare ourselves to manage this and to behave. So single party and all party states. Almost certainly your hospital has a policy about this. And It'd be, it's important that you know what that policy is and what it says and what it doesn't say. It almost certainly has something like you're not allowed to do that in here. But again, once it's happened, I'm not sure that a hospital policy provides any real insulation from it being posted or it being shared out. What about HIPAA? You're thinking, hey, finally, HIPAA is going to do something for me. And if that's what you're thinking, unfortunately, you'd be wrong. <laughs> Uh, HIPAA law only applies to the covered entity, which in our, uh, with regard to the emergency department, is the hospital. And so the patients have no obligations under HIPAA law to do anything. 
It's the covered entity must protect their private information. So potentially a hospital could run into HIPAA trouble if someone were recording and streaming and blasting out there, if they weren't doing everything that they could do to prevent private information from being included in that. But the patients have no obligation under HIPAA. They can, they can do it and HIPAA has nothing to say about it. So this is interesting. Why are patients doing this? Why are, why are patients recording? How, first of all, how many are doing it and why might they be doing it? So it'd be interesting to ask. And that's exactly what this group did in a survey of patients in the United Kingdom. Ask them questions around, have you recorded? Uh, have you thought about recording? Do you know people have recorded? Have you done it with the knowledge of the provider or have you done it in secret? Really interesting uh, information gathered by asking these questions. And a fair amount of patients, people have recorded, new people who have recorded, and there's a pretty equal split there between a desire to just do it with permission or to just, or to do it and ask permission or to just do it secretly. But here's where the really interesting feedback from these patients comes. When the question's asked, why would you secretly record? And we have, a, I think, a sense that one of the primary drivers of people, patients secretly recording us is to catch us, to make us look bad, uh, as was a, you know, the example of the video uh, from just a moment ago. But nobody, when asked this question in the survey, had answers any, around there at all. Their answers were things like, to better understand my care. I wanna create a record of this that I can refer back to. I wanna be able to share this with my family. I want my kids or my parents to have a chance to hear what the doctor had to say. And I didn't necessarily really understand what I was instructed to do or what the follow-up was. And it feels empowering. It's like giving patients access to their portal. They're in there playing around and looking at their labs. It's, it gives them a sense of owning their own data and owning their own care, which is, I, I think, a good thing. So why don't they just ask, right? I think often enough we'd be willing to share if it's going to contribute to their care and to their well-being and they're going to feel good about it. Well, they describe eh, it's better to beg forgiveness than ask permission. But also there's a fear of repercussions for asking. They don't, they're afraid of us, which is kind of sad, but I think uh, not surprising. And there's, they're embarrassed that they don't necessarily understand what we're telling them. And they're embarrassed that they don't remember what they're supposed to do. And, and I think we've all had that experience of patients not asking questions or not, um, not necessarily following our instructions, but because they didn't necessarily understand what we were asking them to do and they were embarrassed to get further uh, details about that. So a super connector opportunity, a super risk management opportunity to consider is let them record you or let them take pictures. Um, and so this is a picture from social media. The young lady on the left there took a uh, selfie of her and her sister while she's in labor. So I wouldn't recommend you necessarily do it this way, but I offer patients uh, on a fairly regular basis, the opportunity to take pictures of me doing procedures for them or suturing up a wound, or if they wanna make a little video, um, I'm gonna try to get out in front of them, like surreptitiously taking the picture that they're gonna post on, on their social media. Uh, I've been asked if I would be willing to be in TikToks and that's kind of where I draw the line. Um, but what's the harm in letting somebody take a picture of something you're doing? You've sutured thousands of wounds. Um, you do it all the time, it's fine. What's the harm of having them record you giving your standard undifferentiated abdominal pain discharge instructions? Uh, it may feel a bit uncomfortable at first, but I'd rather have them have that information. And then if this turns out to be a bad outcome, something I didn't diagnose on that first visit, if they walk out thinking, hey, he did everything he could, he connected, he communicated, he even let us record him, you can see it's a, it could be a potentially really powerful risk management tool. So super connector opportunity. Back to being recorded. So if you find out after the fact that you've been recorded, appreciate that the stakes are really high and very likely your emotions are gonna be out of control. So this is a hijack, an emotional hijack and you gotta really buckle down and take care of business, meaning patient care comes first. Once the patient care is, is managed and the patient's stabilized then you're in a good place Gather yourself, gather your team, and figure out how and who 
best is best positioned to engage with the person that has been doing the recording. It almost certainly isn't going to be you if you were involved in being recorded. So identify who that person is, have them interface with the patient, and get a sense of what they were doing. I, I was recorded doing a kind of a crash intubation at one point, and we looked up and the family member was recording us at the end of the stretcher, and the whole team was completely hijacked by it. We were able to stabilize the patient and manage that and gathered our team. And actually the administrator on call um, came in and uh, went to the daughter of the patient. The, per and the, da the daughter had been the one doing the recording and just kind of talked to her and said, hey, the team saw that you were recording them. That was really upsetting for them. They didn't think that they didn't know you were gonna be doing it and, and they were concerned that it didn't really capture them in their best light. And really interesting, the patient's daughter's response was that of she was um, beside herself that she had upset us. She described that she saw her mother, you know, her mother kind of like crashed right in front of us and she panicked, she didn't know what to do. And she said the first thing I could, the only thing I could think of to do was to record that so that I would have something to show my dad um, in case mom died. And so she was, the patient ended up doing fine but the daughter was really kind of beside herself that she had upset us. She immediately deleted it and apologized and the problem was solved right there. So don't make assumptions about what the patient's motivation necessarily is. Sometimes it, it, it may not be, um, sometimes it may be a problem. Never, never, never touch or threaten. If they've got it recorded, that's theirs. Um, you're better off dealing with whatever repercussions come uh, than you are trying to take a phone away or something like that. Mobilize your support team and your local site, your team, your hospital certainly has a support team that you can pull in to help to take care of you and the rest of the team. And the other thing is that it's probably not just upsetting, uh, certainly not just upsetting for you. It's really, in the experience that I have, is really upsetting for everybody on the team. So just be sensitive to that. All right, wouldn't be a risk management talk without a case. So we're gonna close up with a case here. This is a real case, 55 year old uh, man that was riding his motorcycle struck by an SUV. Arrived to the emergency department as a trauma code. This is not a level one trauma center. Had some trauma services, but not really comprehensive trauma services. Arrived obtunded and intubated. The ED doc and the trauma team did the best they can. Activated the whole trauma uh, alert and pan scan. Patient had multiple terrible injuries, pelvic fracture, femur fracture. Uh, verte vertebral fractures, was never stable, uh, was going to be transfused uh, on arrival. The transfusion got delayed. There was a plan to transfer pretty much right away, but that also got delayed. The patient's condition declined in over three and a half hours and eventually expired in the emergency department prior to the transfer taking place. Lawsuit comes sometime later alleging failure to act urgently to address the bleeding and failure to uh, transfer in a timely fashion. Plaintiff experts uh, claim doc should have transferred the patient immediately, should have given blood sooner, CT delayed care, and should have done a fast scan instead, and should have applied a pelvic binder for the pelvic fractures. So some Maybe claims with merit in there, some maybe not. The defense experts' rebuttals. ED doc did the best that he could with the available resources, not being at a level one trauma center, taking care of what was a devastating set of injuries. The pelvic binder thing is, that, that doesn't make any sense. That would have actually probably worsened bleeding. And the patient ultimately died of neurogenic shock due to a bunch of cervical fractures and essentially this was an unsurvivable set of injuries, and there's nothing that anyone could have done under any circumstances that would have led to a different outcome than the outcome that the patient eventually had. The case goes to trial, and from the trial transcript, the attorney asks, all right, so you're back from CT scanning, you call for your helicopter transport, you made your presentation to the Yale trauma docs, yep. They've given you some pathway to follow regarding pressures. The jury heard all that. What'd you next do in terms of the patient? After I arranged for transport? 
Yes. I believe I ordered an EKG, right? And I tried to contact the family. Oh, tell me more about that. All right, so you call people on that. There's no answer. You call his place of work. Was human resources open that day? No. So what did you tell the security guard to do? I asked them if he would use his key to open it up and see if they could find information in his file so that I could get a phone number and call his family. Well, why were you doing that? Because I didn't want him to be alone. And if very rarely do jury trials in real life look like jury trials on TV and in the movies, but if there was ever one that was made to order for TV or movies, this could be it. Because with that line, because I didn't want him to be alone, there wasn't a dry eye in the jury box. And at that point, it was clear to everybody in the room that this trial was over and this was going to be a defense verdict because it was so entirely clear that the physician was driven by a desire to care, not just for this person who was dying in front of him, but really for him and his entire family. So manage yourself, manage your risk. Be empowered. To reduce your risk by being your best self. Use shared decision making. Be prepared for emotional upset. Become an empathy dosing expert. Use empathy like medicine. You have the power to reduce your risk of being sued by being your best self. Thank you.